welcome to Bash Clinic. Uh, it is our uh, week for the English presentation because we alternate French and uh, English uh, during our session. And we have the great pleasure today to welcome uh, Julikin from uh, Participate, uh, who will discuss with us the great work they are doing around the self-sustainable development goals. So, Julie. Okay, um, one, one correction is I love the self-sustainable. They're not the self-sustainable development goals. They are the sustainable development goals. Um, we did not make them up, they're from the UN. Um, and so we have been working with uh, around the SDGs. I've invited some colleagues here, um, Kim Murphy and Linda Zardziki, um, to sort of talk about the great work that they've been doing. Um, and so we're gonna sort of launch into that. But before we start, I'd love to, um, Simone and Serge, if you can talk a little bit about the work that you're doing with open recognition, I think that can also sort of frame how we talk about what we're doing with um, the SDGs and communities of practice. Do you mind doing that? Okay, just quickly, the idea of open recognition emerged from open badges, uh, from the dissatisfaction we had with badges that were mainly used to formally recognize informal learning. Badges were invented to recognize informal learning. Unfortunately, it was limited to formal recognition of informal learning. And uh, from this unsatisfaction, with uh, Ned Otto and uh, Don Present, we decided to write the Bologna Open Recognition Declaration with the idea that we could use badges not just to recognize informal learning, but to make visible informal recognition. Uh, which is a big step uh, forward. So really the work we do uh, with uh, open uh, recognition is this idea that everybody has the power to recognize and should use that power. I can't make it quicker. I love it. And Simone, would you also like, um, and then we can maybe introduce the participate folks on the call, but. Yeah, sure. So. Uh, like many of us, it was the open badges mindset that, you know, got us to think about what's more around badges, you know, how can we really think deeper and higher around recognition technologies. And, and so the shift of focus toward this idea of informally recognizing informal learning was very appealing and it was you know, what has been driving this idea of the Open Recognition Alliance, which is really addressing more than any other community around digital credentials, the you know, social impact and application into different contexts, particularly supporting, for example, um, you know, unserved populations or fragile segments of the population. And, and that angle, more humanitarian to some extent, is very, is very appealing, I think, that is where the, the, the highest potential for the application of this uh, technology uh, could be uh, beneficial. And so within the Open Recognition Alliance, a lot of the conversation are really just pushing the envelope in terms of how do we think about this uh, recognition technologies. Oh, you're muted, Ju uh, Julie. Just saying hi to Carrie and Justin. How are you? Yay, all of our badging friends are here. Um, okay, I, um, since we are actually on the um, <laughs> schedule to present, I will go ahead and do that. Um, so the way that we thought we could um, structure this is, um, I don't think I need to really um, talk about too much of what participate is. I think uh, everyone on the call that I can tell knows, but again, we are, um, uh, an education technology company and we participate Inc. as a social learning platform. It is now completely sort of designed to be to support communities of practice. And so one of those communities of practice is um, around the sustainable development goals. Um, we consider this community of practice to be almost our participate lab. So we bring in lots of folks um, into this. It's all focused on 
the SDGs. This is something that Liz in particular has been working on. Um, so she's going to be talking a lot about this as will Kim. Um, thinking about what kinds of learning experiences can we provide to educators um, and to their kids um, to really get them engaged in the SDGs because about, I guess Kim uh, and Liz, I think this is probably almost four years ago now, um, we were at a conference um, which was around public health and international global health. And when you look at the SDGs, the map of the 17 goals, it looked like a curriculum map to us. There were lots of very easy ways to really connect to the curriculum. Um, if you were doing design-based thinking or project-based learning, the SDGs just sort of focused right in on that. How can we think about climate action? How can we think about social justice? How can we think about gender equality? And how can we make very specific connections to the curriculum? Um, allowing teachers to really dive into both their standards and their core content, um, but then again, you know, really sort of connect it to um, real life social action. So I'm going to right now share my screen um, and we're just going to go right into the platform. Um, and then I'm going to pass it off to uh, to my uh, participate friends to kind of take it from there to, to sort of talk about instructional design and then to really attach it to the badging. So in participate, our badging is very much um, structured along um, our courses um, and our learning experiences. And I'd like to talk a little bit more about that as the conversation goes on. But essentially, as um, folks go through a learning experience on Participate, and particularly a course, they can interact with peer mentors. Kim's going to talk about that. And then um, when they have that sort of conversation and when um, learning products are shared and peer mentors are able to review those learning products, then a badge is triggered um, based on that learning experience. Um, so if I can also pause if there's any other questions, but essentially that's how the open badges are used right now on Participate. Um, so what you're looking at right now is sort of my home screen. This is me, Julie. These are the communities that I belong to over here. And then you can see our different facilitators and our different communities that I belong to um, that also use a, a feed. So Kim is the one of the facilitators of the SDG community. And so I'm going to jump in there since that's what we're talking about today. So this is what a community of practice looks like as it's focused on the SDGs. So this is sort of home base. So here on the right hand side is the sort of community feed. And, and again, we try to keep this very active. Right now we have over right a thousand members um, that are act, that are in this community and are taking part in different what we call different activities and time based learning experiences where Kim and Liz will run different design clinics around specific goals. Um, and folks can then engage. And again, I don't want to jump ahead of myself because I'm going to let um, Liz sort of talk a little bit about this, but I just want to show the kind of pieces of the community of practice. So here's where our courses live, right? Um, and again, we also use this space as um, for learning experiences. So these can be asynchronous, more formal courses, but they can also be um, two week design clinics where we invite teachers in to really think about a particular goal. Um, discussions is where a lot of action takes place. Um, so you can sort of see different um, areas of discussion. And again, each of these discussions um, allow folks to kind of talk to each other. Also in participate, every time someone shares a resource, it's scraped on the side so that each discussion has its own library. And again, since we are a small group today, please stop me at any point. Um, within Participate, you can also curate resources. So these are different collections, um, different ways in which, again, the facilitators in the community can curate resources um, for the community. Um, here are members, and we have, we just launched direct messaging, which we're also very exciting. So in-app messaging, so I can also message Kim at any time to actually reach her directly. And it is so exciting. So we're using this a lot. <laughs> um, okay, so um, this is sort of, again, the structure of the community of practice. Um, and again, we use this um, a lot. Um, so we also, because of the announcement feed, which is now increasingly being used as a news feed, um, we're able to sort of, again, keep very much pace with what's happening in the world. So um, 
that's why we were focusing a lot around Women's Day um, and then connecting it with global goal number five, which is around gender equity. Um, so one, what I, just to go back to an earlier comment I made, um, we use this really as a learning design lab. So the ways in which we sort of experiment with learning design, um, a lot of that happens in this community. Um, so I'm gonna, Liz, if you're ready, I'm just gonna sort of pass it off to you and I'm either happy to stop sharing if you would like to share or you can have me drive, you decide. Yeah, maybe, maybe if you can stop sharing and I can drive, that would be helpful. Um, just so I can, I can pull up things while I'm talking about them. Um, can everybody see that? Yep. Does that show up? Great. Hi, uh, I'm Liz Radzicki. I am an education specialist at Participate with a focus on instructional design and learning experience design. Um, and so my role in the Teach the Global Goals community is um, sort of uh, more, more designing the experiences and then, and then I, Kim and I work really collaboratively together. Uh, so I sort of build them and then hand them over to her and then she runs them. Um, and it's a really nice setup, I think. Um, but having, having things that are always designed with engagement in mind um, is, is huge for us in this community. Um, so like Julie was saying, the main domain of this, of this community of practice is connecting the sustainable development goals um, sort of the global to-do list for how we um, keep our planet humming along for another millennium, hopefully. Um, and, and how do we connect that to academic learning that happens in classrooms? So that's the main domain. And then within that, there are a huge array of competencies. Everything from, you know, how do you talk about complicated and controversial topics with your students to how do you, um, to really specific um, content things around statistical literacy. Um, so, and, and then everything in between. Um, and so we, I think we started, it's been a real evolution of this, of this community and how we approach learning and how we look at learning in this community. Started with 17 mini courses, one for each of the sustainable development goals. And it was really just sort of like, hey, here's some resources, here's some ideas, here's some ways to get started. Um, I wouldn't call them formal, but they were very structured um, and they were very static. Um, we didn't ask a lot of teachers because at that point we were really also sort of seeing this as a marketing tool, um, a way to get teachers engaged and involved in things, but to do so in a way that was also helpful to them. Um, so we didn't ask a lot of them really just to kind of talk about these issues with their students, do something with them and, and share with us how, how they did that. Um, and then it really kind of morphed and evolved. We had this um, three week or four week long design clinic where we really walked through, um, and I'll show what that looks like. Um, um, it was created to be sort of an intensive experience for teachers who are wanting to create project-based units around the sustainable development goals. Um, so we went through the backwards design process. Um, we, we sort of housed it within a specific time frame um, and asked people to come along with us week by week um, to do that. And then they ended up with a fully created unit plan or project plan where their students would investigate and take action on one of the sustainable development goals. So we housed that as this, as this course that kind of we added to every week. Um, and we had a number of different ways that, that educators could engage with these ideas. Um, a lot of it happened here, but honestly, most of it happened here in the discussion. Um, and so we had teachers sharing nuggets of ideas, seeds of ideas to their fully fleshed out unit plans. And then they came back when they actually shared the units with their students and facilitated these projects. Students were like saving sea turtles and, you know, and uh, what were some of the other ones, Kim, that we really loved? Cafeteria work, you know. Yes. Yep. Less yeah. food waste, redesigning their um, 
their lunch rooms, cutting down on plastics, some really, really nice pieces. Yeah. School gardens. I mean, they, they came up with these really beautiful ideas. And the whole point behind this was to, um, to really um, help teachers give their students more of a voice in what these projects could look like. Um, and so really anchor it in what the students cared about and, and the kinds of um, impact the students wanted to have in their communities of practice. So, so in terms of instructional design, what we were looking at um, in the discussion in particular was were they, were they able to, to really identify the learning objectives that they wanted their students to, take, to, um, to learn? Were they able to connect that with, um, you know, think through evidence of what it might look like when those learning objectives were, were met? Um, were they able to come up with, um, you know, products that would, would sort of demonstrate the, that learning? Were they able to sequence and come up with activities? Um, and so at every step along the way, we asked people to, to post their work here as it was in progress. Um, and then they were, they gave each other feedback. We gave each other, we gave them feedback. Um, and and Kim, Kim can kind of talk about our, our, our philosophy around, around feedback. Um, yeah, so that's that. So that's one <laughs> one form that a learning experience takes in here. Um, you know, another one um, that's really different that's not in a course at all is what we just posted. I mean, we have um, we were like, what are you what are you talking about with your students in terms of coronavirus? Can we can we get beyond just wash your hands for twenty seconds and really think about this in terms of as global citizens? You know, how has globalization led to spread of disease and how can globalization lead to eradication of disease and pandemic? Um, you know, what are the factors, how is, how is a global health crisis impacting other factors in terms of economics, um, in terms of education, in terms of job opportunities and growth? Um, and so we really wanted to find out what teachers are doing. We just posted this, so I'm not sure how active it's gonna be, but um, again, providing resources, but we, we view this as a learning experience. Um, because it's teachers coming together, they're talking about stuff, they're, they're sharing ideas. This is a learning experience. Um, my, uh, Kim, <laughs> our favorite one was the um, summer camp. Where's summer that? camp, yes. So this was not a course at all. It was just sort of like weekly challenges that we, that we would send out to people in the community and like, hey, this week we want you to try this tool we want you to, um, you know, try, go out in your community and look for um, all of the people who are working towards the SDGs. So we would give them these kind of bite-sized challenges and then ask them to come in here and discuss what, what they learned, what they experienced. Um, that was a learning experience. So, so re this really broad understanding of what a learning experience can, can look like that gets beyond sort of the typical like online course of read a thing and then post a short essay that proves that you did something. Um, and so really, again, anchoring it in engagement and connection, anchoring it in how can, how can educators use this in their daily practice um, and, and what we can learn from them. So one of the, just, I'm sorry, Liz, I'm just going to yeah, bump in I'm here done. too, is that, <laughs> <laughs> so one thing that we, and then Kim, I'm going to pass it off to you, because mm -hmm. this is, um, you know, around last year, and Serge, and some, I might have told you about this, but, you know, one thing that we did with the badging um, is, you know, in the, in the core structure, right, so you're able to essentially submit something to a peer, have them review it, right? And it's very focused on the work. Because one thing I did not mention with the communities of practice, because I think pretty much everyone on the call knows the sort of three legs of the stool of a community of practice is like the actual community, right? So it brings back the sort of sustained group. The ORA is a perfect example of a community of practice. You guys, come, you know, we all come every week to the extent that we can. We're thinking through these things around open recognition, right? That's the sort of domain of it. Um, and then what's the practice of it? It's the calls, it's the conferences, it's the mm -hmm. et cetera. And so the SDG community is, has that as well. And I think Kim can sort of talk about, um, you know, we have people that are coming back for these experiences oh, yeah. over and over again. Um, and so what we, what I'd like to see in terms of our technology right now, again, the badge, we've moved beyond just, okay, you submit when you're done with a course, right? And you submit a learning product and then you have a peer mentor review it. 
and then the badge gets triggered, right? And then the badge shows up in your profile. Now we have finally gotten to sort of more formative feedback um, and we have to kind of go back and rebuild some of our older courses because this just got released earlier this month, right? Um, and that's where Liz and Kim as learning designers can sort of build in interactions and Don as well in the middle of a learning experience. And then those formative pieces would get shot to a peer mentor, right? And Kim's adorable kid. Sorry. Um, and then you can start a conversation with a mentor, right? Um, and so that is where we're at right now. But again, the discussions and the learning experiences that Liz just showed you, right now those, the, the badges are still attached to the courses. Does that make sense? So, you know, in terms of just sort of a showing evidence from when you've talked or again, you know, other areas of the platform where you're doing activity, right now that's not baked into the badge. It's still tied to the course. Does that make sense? Yeah. So that's, we're sort of, that's kind of the next iteration of the, of the open badges within the platform is sort of detaching it um, and really making sure that it, we can capture sort of learning experiences from across the platform and across the community practice. I, I will say what that forced us to do is anchor a lot of that, like I said, in the discussions. Um, and so it really kind of opened that out um, where it's not just, you know, it's not just work going to one select mm -hmm. person or two select people. It's really kind of putting it out to the, to the community and, and asking for feedback from, from peers. Um, and I, I don't think we're going to stop doing that because we have this other <laughs> tool in our tool belt now. For um, sure. We saw I so think you'll do both. Yeah. 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 The question is, is how is the community visible? Because uh, there, there is a participate. Uh, but how are these communities visible from the outside? So I think, A, you can, you know, basically folks come into this community from here. So this is open, right? So anyone can sort of join this community and engage. And I think I'll, I'll shoot that to Kim too, which is a lot of the community is visible through those discussions, right? right? You Are you saying community. sort of how you... Yes, you join the community. That is correct. And so, so you could you could find it a couple of ways. One is if you knew about participate and you knew that participate was a place where they have communities, um, you would go to participate. And there's a place called Discover Communities. And so all of our open communities are visible there. So um, teach the global goals. Um, there's one around project-based learning. Um, our our partner um, Qatar Foundation International, Empatico. So all of these organizations that that house their communities that are open there. That's one way. Another way is you know we're pretty big on Twitter, so we post a lot of <laughs> things that are happening uh, yeah. on social media, um, word of mouth. Um, so we have I think we have three thousand people in this community now, and so oh. everybody kind of right. yeah yeah we're a big right. deal. Um, you know, and so I think people f have found their way in through various things, you know, maybe, maybe their school required them to do a course with us, or maybe, um, they were, they've been really hungry to do this kind of work and they saw us on, on Twitter, um, connected to one of the SDG hashtags or something like that. So I think there's, there's a couple different avenues that they get. Did that answer your question, Serge? Yeah, yes, but I, I th I'm not totally satisfied, but okay, we can discuss. Yeah, uh, well, yeah we can, not we can discuss that later. Because the, 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 the community is very much organized around the courses. And the no, the community is organized around this domain of SDGs and not right. organized around the courses anymore. And that is something that I think happened with the instructional design. Initially, they were organized around the courses. That's how we thought about it when we built it. But then once the, the platform sort of caught up with our vision of a community as a practice, now it's really happening in the conversation. That's where most of the activity is happening. It's still within the platform. That is, yeah. for example, the, the idea of, because the community of, of SDGs is broader, Right. So, I mean, I don't know if Mark is still on the call or not, but one thing is we have this sort of, again, uh, a design, um, a framework of an outer loop, inner loop. So when Liz was mentioning Twitter, right, we engage with folks around the SDGs in much broader communities than just what's happening in the platform, right? So if there's a conversation happening at the UN or it's happening on Twitter around teachers who are doing the SDGs that are, that's, I mean, there's tens of thousands of teachers that are probably associated with that hashtag on Twitter, right? Then we will then plug into those and bring them into more sustained community and more sustained practice within participate, but then they pop back out 
to have conversations elsewhere, right? So we're trying to sort of connect within a connected learning ecosystem, right? So it's not just the platform, it's how do we also talk to folks outside that and then draw them back in and then pop them back out. But so we, could, we could use badges in order to connect this all community. Yes, agreed. So yes. something to discuss. Yes. yes. So Kim, I wanted you to sort sure. of really talk about a little bit about the, your community facilitation techniques because I think a lot of that is, I think that's related, yeah. I'm not muted, right? Okay, perfect. So um, yeah, one of the things that Liz was sharing, um, oh, and I guess I should introduce myself first. My name's Kim Murphy, and I work really closely with Liz as she was saying. Um, we're both education strategists, um, but my role primarily is facilitation and um, having a background in education where I've, I've been for the past 20 years, like this is just a dream for me to be able to support um, educators in this way of, of helping them to engage inside communities and really get the most out of them. So in this community, you know, when we were talking about connecting our learners um, to all these different ways to engage and grow together, it really is that that byproduct of careful planning. So um, Liz and I are constantly in contact about, you know, what our, what our members need, um, where they seem to be maybe lacking in some of the, some of the skills or understandings. And then we're always constantly getting feedback from them and working to uh, create new learning opportunities for them so that they can engage. And really um, facilitation is, is all about that, right? Like meeting the needs of our learners and making sure that what we're providing them with is engaging them and that they want to keep coming back to learn more. So just to kind of give you a little bit of a look, because I know that um, we kind of shared some of that of what it looks like, you know, to go into those discussions, to take courses and to share with one another. But I wanted to give you just a kind of inside look of what it looks like when we're thinking about the needs of our learners and then um, what we're gaining through the mentorship and the review and where we see those skills might be lacking, how we meet those needs. So one of the things that Liz and I had seen um, in the community is this idea of service learning and, you know, wanting to grow beyond just um, maybe a sock drive or a food drive or a collection of some type and really helping our um, teachers support their students and taking service learning back out into the community. And so um, we met and, and looked at, you know, our target learners, like, who are they? What is it that they need? And um, the objectives that they that we want to make sure that that we're covering and different ways that we can go about that. So we can use that backwards design even for ourselves and thinking about these engagements and what they should look like. And what this led to was a really unique um, opportunity for us where we had a service learning breakout where we took a small group of our community members and we did a, like a deep dive into what service learning might look like. We provided this, this toolkit guide for them sort of as an overarching way to structure this learning, but then they created and helped co-create the pieces inside for other community members. So um, we, we broke it down into week by week, thinking about the academic rigor and the social and emotional components to that. And then we met weekly with them in a Zoom call and talked about, you know, these understandings and, and how they could take this back into their classroom. So this was just an example of um, mentorship sort of in a unique way because it wasn't through a course that they were submitting at the end but mentoring them along the way as we we took in their ideas and their and their um and offered feedback to them kind of like on the spot as it grew and um one of the things that we're noticing because i think of these these mentoring opportunities where you know courses come in we offer them feedback ideas for growth give them suggestions and help them um, connect to those pathways inside the communities is we're starting to notice just this like organic networking of members on our platform where I know this member in particular she is a member of the, the teach the S or teach the global goals community but she's also a part of the PBL community so she's taking what she's learning in in one community and pulling it into another and here she's working on uh, we had a uh, lens of looking at ideas through, you know, how we build community together. And this, this, in this community was looking at collaboration and partnerships. And so she was taking what she was learning in the Teach the Global Goals community and then pulling it back out here into the PBL community. So she's like naturally 
leading others into new understandings that they didn't have. And so the, you see this like cross pollination of ideas across our communities. And so she's here, they're working um, in a community garden. So some ideas she pulled from there into, into the, um, and, and just a nice connection of ideas building from that. And so we've taken that understanding and sort of done the same thing for ourselves. We have a new community that we have available on our platform for those that are facilitators or administrators of communities. And we're talking about social learning, just how do we support those that are on our community, um, in our communities to build ideas together. And we're looking at networking together. So this is a community here where we're thinking about building communities beyond our own communities on on the platform. So we have a lot of members coming in and sharing ideas about the ways that they're building community and connecting members to members. So it's sort of just this been an organic growth of ideas that are forming. And um, I think we have the direct messaging now, which has just been a really great feature because I'm seeing even in um, peer review or peer mentoring in the mentorship that I can reach out a lot more quicker uh, with those direct messages and help pull my learners in in different ways so that you know just a little nudge or a little nurture along the way so it doesn't necessarily even have to be in a formal review of a course but also being able to to offer you know that that person beside them to help to guide and facilitate their learning so we're seeing this just just grow in so many different ways on our platform julie is there anything that you that you wanted me to cover um that i didn't cover do me a favor, Kim, go to your profile for a minute. So let me just show you where I'm just going to show you. Kim's, Kim's going to show you her badges. All right. So right now they're sitting. Um, uh, Kim, if you go to your credentials right there, right? So these are all of the things that Kim has done. So I think what you were sort of getting at, Serge, is and where I think I'd like to, where, you know, Mark and I, I know, I'm not going to speak for him, but um, where we'd like to push the platform, which is this is part of that reputation. So Kim knows organically, right, that the people that you were just talking about, the, they are connecting with each other across multiple communities within the platform. Um, but if you go, you know, in order to see what they've done in terms of just past work within the platform, you go into their profile and then you can see these and you can click into these and just like any open badge, you can sort of see what they do. But I do think there's more dynamic ways um, where those badges can function in a way that makes people more visible to one another, right? And that the recognition that they provide to one another, I think, can be more visible, right? But this is where this happens. And I do think, I mean, we probably don't have enough analytics on, but I'm, I, I think now that direct messaging and, and people sort of being able to find each other on the platform is a little bit easier and ways to connect are much easier um, to the extent that folks are going into people's, into, uh, you know, a peer's um, profile, just like we did with Kim, and sort of check out what her badges are. Um, and check out what her credentials are um, and the sort of work that she's done. Because the other thing that's cool is that within what's baked into our batch is the conversation with the peer. So not only do you see the learning product, you see the entire conversation that happened um, with the peer mentor and with the, um, and with the learner. But again, that's a two-way conversation, right? I mean, I do think there's some really interesting ways with a within a community of practice where the badge could pull in the whole community conversation, right? Because that's the reason you've been pushing everything in the discussions is so that it's everyone. It's not just a one-to-one -one between a learner and a peer mentor, right? Because the badge is very much functioning in that, in that space, right? But if you're talking about sort of a community of practice, where's the community in that, right? It's still, it's still focused on the individual learner. And Don, I don't know if you want to pipe in here too or whatever, but um, I'd like, that's where, that's sort of where my head is, is how does the, how does our, our current badging structure really support a community of practice in addition to an individual learner's development and in addition to the relationship between the, the learner and their peer mentor, right? I, I, just to chime in really quickly, I think the way that a platform is set up now with the, with the peer uh, and peer mentorship piece, you're giving feedback along the way. So it's not this summative thing at the end where it kind of feels evaluative. You know, I, I feel that uh, giving feedback along the way shows investments like a, you know, on, on both parts, right? On, on the mentor and on also the, the mentee uh, in terms of, uh, you know, 
their investment and you know the, the growth of uh, the learning. So uh, I really appreciate that part. I think on the flip side of that too, one of the things that we've been we've been doing and Julie's been taking the lead on is um, uh, trying to reach out to the people we call ghosters. Um, the people who maybe are not as engaged as we would like them to be or start off really engaged and then drop off. Um, but, but things we've heard in terms of feedback that we take really seriously is that, you know, I don't want my work to be, to have feedback in a public space where there are thousands of people who I don't know. And so actually having spaces for those one-on-one -on -one conversations is necessary for the way that a lot of people want to learn. Um, and, the, and, and the way that people learn best. So I think, you know, again, just providing different options is, is really important um, to us. It's one, of our, it's one of our main learning principles for adult learning, which is, you know, provide, provide multiple pathways and let people kind of choose how they wanna engage with things. And, and because of that, the relationships that are building, you know, the trust and the relationships where maybe in the beginning, members aren't as open to share out like I'm struggling in this area but because of support and be through mentorship then they find that strength you know to start sharing out ideas and discussions where I see you know they're starting to, to raise a hand like hey I need a little help here and the community is uh, diving in to help support those learners and one of the things that we've seen over time is just those discussions are are not just necessarily sharing of ideas but also providing that feedback too so what we're modeling through uh, mentorship in the coursework is also being seen inside the community discussions where mentor where members are standing in as those mentors and providing feed, uh, feedback as well. So I, I understand what you have done is much broader than, than badges. Okay, that's, uh, that's clear and you have done a, a great, great job here, here from, from what I can perceive. Uh, but my, my focus is about recognition, okay, and uh, and so when, when, uh, when I see the badges, does the teachers have badges or do you also issue badges to, uh, to the pupils? Can we see the badges of pupils? Uh, no, we don't have students in here. We're only for adults. So Participate doesn't issue badges so, to kids. So, so do you, you see, if you want to, to build a community of practice, it's, it's a community uh, where there is communication between a uh, committee of practice of teachers, but also committee of practice around SDGs. And this committee of practice in SDGs include pupils as well. Or, uh, that's uh, true, students. but that's true. But in, in our case, we are a community of adult learners. Uh, so, so in that way, we are, we're, we're sort of like closed off, but the, the, you know, we have in terms of, in terms of different types of adult learners, it's not just educators, right? So this is a community around sustainable development goals. Yes. And in most, I would say the majority of folks are working with kids and sort of engage and sort of share learning products, but the kids are not actively engaged in the conversation on the platform. Yeah, I understand. But maybe the kids are, are, are actively involved into uh, Absolutely. SDG practices. Absolutely. Uh, and so they could be recognized for their practices. I mean, the, the, the last post I, I wrote was about recognition to recognize practices rather than recognizing competencies. Uh, and then you can have practices around the SDGs and say, uh, we are the, uh, the animator of these uh, communities, but these, co these communities of uh, practice are not the community of practice of teach. It's not the same thing to be a community of practice of teachers, of educators. This is one community and a yep. community of practice around SDGs. So I think in this case, the community of practice that is on the platform, right, because the SDGs are massive, right? So you, you could just, you could, I mean, it, it's almost, it gets beyond the capacity of even that one conversation. What that conversation is about is really around how we're bringing it into our classrooms and into our community and there's tons of recognition of the ways in which kids are doing that right so in terms of those kind of community projects those are all over those discussions within participants absolutely these recognitions are not visible so visible. this is where i want to i want to and maybe i'll bring in the other folks that like when you say this the recognition is not visible so what we see is that the recognition is visible in the conversation right so so there's no question that that recognition is there, right? Because folks are sort of talking to each other. So yeah. where, so when you, but you're, but so 
what else are you thinking of when you're talking about recognition? Right? Well, uh, recognition is, is about, uh, it's a stream of recognition. So mm -hmm. if you want to, to, to recognize SDG practices, yep. you can make them visible and use badges to make them visible. I understand they are visible within the conversation, but if you want to make them visible outside, you could use badges. And yes. one of the things I've learned uh, uh, is, is when you develop a product, you don't develop it for the client, but for the client of the client. Right, right. So well, we're definitely understand doing that. that as educator, you think that your clients are the teachers or the educators, and you develop products for the teachers and educators, but you might think also to develop a product for the clients of your clients. And oh, I mean, yeah. And I, the SDGs, providing the means for your clients to recognize their clients. Right. I see what you're saying. I mean, I think, I think, you know, where, and again, Kim and Liz jump in in terms of just things that are on the discussions. There's no question in terms of the practices of kids, right? And the agency of kids that is happening there where you are a thousand percent correct is that teachers really could be showcasing those practices to a much broader community from outside of the platform through those badges. And that is the capability is there. The technology is there. The practice, not so much. Where we did see that, and again, I see Liz is about to talk, is with Empatico. And again, this we can sort of, we have some time to talk about that, but Liz, go ahead. Well, what, what that's made me think of is just how we can frame those badges differently. And so instead of something that the teacher is earning, that is something that you, like you as a teacher and your students are earning together. And so, and I think that that is how some teachers are viewing those of like, hey, my kids did this amazing thing here. They print out their badge, they put it on their door. And that's this thing that, I mean, it's, they do. <laughs> and that's this thing that, um, that you know, m my students and I earned together because we did this work together. And so I do think that that is happening. I think we can be a lot clearer about that and really, really focus our framing of those, of that badge that you earn. And not only that, I think we might see higher completion rates. If all of a sudden this is now recognition of, of my students' work instead of, well, I don't need a badge. I'm fine. Like I, you know, I came and I got my ideas and we did the thing and it was great. I don't need a badge. But it's like, well, now if we frame that as like, kind of you and your students are earning this badge together. That could be, I, I'm, I'm interested in how that might impact completion rates. Makes me think of those you challenges, just, Liz, yeah, like, totally. you know, a, a challenge in, in your school or um, in your community to, to earn more together. Because I mean, all of our, all of the things that we do have that thing in mind, Serge, that you're talking about, which is like, what are your students do? Like, how are you supporting your students in taking action? Um, and so I think, I think you're absolutely right that, I, I, that it's happening, but it's not being, it, we're not explicit enough about that. So, you're supporting yeah. the students, but you are not providing a means to make the recognition of their performance, achievements visible to the outside world. But when we, so another thing, so teachers don't like to brag on themselves, but they do like to brag on their students. So when we ask them about what are the things that you're doing well, they're less likely, I think, to jump into the conversations that are framed around that kind of question, where I think they are really excited to share work. And that uh, upcycling toy challenge um, is a great, I don't know, Julie or Kim, if one of you guys can bring that up. Um, but when we asked them to share the work of their students, it was all over the place. I mean, they were, they were sharing photos and, and, and testimonials. Um, and, and they were doing it not only on the platform, but in Twitter, on Instagram as well. And so really anchoring that in the work that the students do. And that's, again, that's kind of at the heart of, of how we approach this. Another one of our learning principles is like learning should be relevant. So, and practical and usable tomorrow. Um, and so when we create things, it's not just how do I, you know, conceptually and intellectually learn new things. It's like, hey, here's something you can go and use with your students to, 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 to get them to take action. And we do yeah. have a lot of teachers also sharing out at, at conferences, like locally and regionally, and even some of the really, you know, the big, big name um, conferences where they're sharing out the badges they earned and what it took to earn that badge and um, showing others how that's possible as well. 
also, um, Kim did a lot of work with this too, which we worked with this group in Patico. They're funded by the Kind Foundation, you know, the snack bars. Um, and so when we supported the organization in doing a fellowship, because they have a platform for, to do virtual exchange, right? Um, so the idea was like, how can we get, have teachers do deeper, have deeper learning experiences so the virtual, virtual exchange is not just like, here's what I eat for lunch. Um, but that you can really kind of dive in and do more collaborative projects um, across, you know, time and space sort of thing. Um, and that was one project where we saw a lot of teachers pushing those badges out. So there was a ton of sort of that reputation building that I think we all know that badges can, you know, can certainly serve that function. But that was really where they were. I saw more examples in that project, I think, Kim, I don't know if others can... Um, where we saw that pushing out. But again, I think it's that it's sort of intentionality of that recognition outside of the platform, and that's the function of the badge. There's no question about that. Um, and to make the work of the community within Participate really visible to all of the communities that are working on SDGs together, right? Um, and yeah, we just have to do a better job of that, I think, but yeah. Well, I think you do a, you, you do a great job from, from what I can see from, from here, so... Uh... Yeah, an even better job. An even better job. <laughs> Maybe also one thing you could uh, you could think about is the timing of uh, badging, because, uh, for example, in a school uh, district in uh, uh, agricultural education in France, um, they started to have a badge for eco citoyen, eco citizen delivered to uh, the pupils. And the badge was delivered at the end of the year if they demonstrated that they, they were eco citizens. This year they decided to change to say you claim your badge of eco citizen. At the beginning, we don't ask for evidence, but claiming the badge is a, a commitment to become an eco citizen. So uh, I, I think this is also, if you think in terms of SDGs, to provide the ability for people to commit to. I want to become a supporter of gender equity. I want to become a supporter of quality education. And, and you can claim that badge, it's just a commitment. And then what, the beauty with badges, you can collect endorsements, you can add evidence, you get connected to with other badge, but you start by showing your commitment publicly. Serge, how has that impacted um, participation in that, in that program, that, the changing of the timing? Uh, uh, first, there were more people doing it, more, uh, and also they felt more of an ownership because it was, it was empowering. Because if you get something at the end, it's a bit like a brownie point, okay? Oh, you did that well, here is your, here is your badge. It is a bit of childish, okay? Now, if you think about, you are working with adults, we want to change society, we want to address the SDGs, then it requires citizenship. And, and so, how do you make the difference between a, a real eco-citizen with a non-eco-citizen? It's simple. You won't get any um, endorsement of, of the badges. Uh, so that, uh, you, you won't see any communication on Twitter. So I think there are ways to, to, to validate uh, commitment, but at, at, at the end, providing an opportunity for, for people to, to think that identity is not something that comes from where you are, but it is also a projection into the future. And I think for SDGs, it is really a projection into the future. So be able to claim, I want, I'm supporting um, you, uh, women, I'm going just to publish a post on, on uh, gender equity because we, we are on a project about gender equity and I was absolutely appalled by a presentation done by OECD uh, uh, on Monday. Uh, you, will, you will read my blog post later, but uh, so. I like what Serge is saying. Another thing you could consider is adding evidence as they proceed because you can, yeah. instead of evidence being one field, you can think about like evidence as it happens. Right, a series of evidence. Well, so that, I mean, that is where, um, and I'll share this video with you too, Carrie, and to the group, I can post it to the Etherpad, where the new interactions that are being built in to the learning experience. So essentially you um, put up a reflection or an artifact or a thought, and that is gonna get baked into the badge as you go along with that conversation. Okay. So it doesn't wait till the end. So that's, that's a big 
we're super psyched. Yeah. yeah, that's awesome. So now, you know, the thing is, is like, it doesn't like poof, like all of the, our learning experiences are automatically retro. So these are now going from here going forward. So Liz and Kim and also others are redesigning existing learning experiences to build those interactions in. But anyway, that's great because that platform. matches the formative experience, right? Yeah. And then you're, you're recognizing it along the way. That's awesome. Yes. Yes. Cool. It's super exciting. That was a, a big, yeah, a big plus. But I do, I mean, I think because I think in some ways it's really almost designing for both, right? So claiming the badge initially as sort of a commitment, right? And then building evidence as you go, right? Right. So you're sort of starting from the, what we have thought about initially as the end, but you start there at the beginning, but then, you know, sort of keeping that opportunity there to kind of go do as you go and building evidence as you go and claiming at the end. I think you can go both ways. You know, Mark, Mark, that um, alt MBA program that you did, that's, that was the model that they used, right? They kind of sent you your, your stuff at the beginning, your certificate. Yeah. And then it was up to you to, to do it. Yeah, and it's really interesting because you'd think it's almost counterintuitive, right? But you actually, did, I mean, you were kind of like motivated to actually, you know, yeah. not just claim it without doing anything, right? And you have a physical my PhD three years ago. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You've been like, I got it. I don't know. They just gave it to me. <laughs> but you have like a physical reminder of like, oh, I really need to. Oh, I'm the worst. <laughs> that, time, that time I cheated. I really, I'm really cheated. I'm a cheater. <laughs> <laughs> So it's really shame-based professional development is what we're, yes. what, what we're about. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, but I do, I mean, the other thing around the badging right now, which is, you know, what you were saying was really having that sort of trusted space where you could sort of really dive into actual artifacts of learning um, in, a, in a space with your peer and that you may not want that public, right? But then we can want those... Um, social among us to also potentially bake in that community conversation and we are thinking about that which is like all right if there's a really vibrant community kim sees these where there's really just incredible things being shared and a lot of reputation being built inside that conversation like really being able to, to you know not just provide a screenshot of it but somehow to really have that dynamic evidence be part of the badge too um and because right now you could actually absolutely screenshot a really great conversation you have with someone and bake that into the badge. There's nothing stopping anyone from doing that. Um, I, think, I think there is also another way you could use badges as a kind of a curation. Uh, so basically, uh, you, you have had a great experience uh, and you want to share that experience. Of course, you can put it in, into the conversation uh, and, and the platform does it very well. But if you put that uh, recipe or that practice within a badge, then suddenly this practice uh, can be shared with others. Uh, and then people can claim that practice. Oh yes, we, I want to. Uh, I want that practice for for myself. So so basically, you reorganize things around practices. Yeah, like having having learners That's create awesome. learning playlists for other for That's other learning. learners. Yeah, and like then that. use the badge for that. Yes, That's the playlist. The badge is a playlist. Absolutely, it is. Yeah. The thing is, you have everything to do it. You do. Next week. <laughs> See you next week. Bro. Next week. That's right. All right here everything, <laughs> everything but time. <laughs> but I do think that's, I mean, I think that's the right way. And I, I agree. I think we have all of the things. I actually don't think, in, even in terms of the tech development. Um, but I, I think using those as, a, as that sort of, that rec really taking those badges as a recognition device and really once you sort of see it in that capacity, like all the different ways that you can sort of use it. Um, I think that's mm -hmm. good. Yes. Kim, let's play with that idea for the climate change. The rec like the badges recognition for you and your class kind of diving into this. Love it. Concept. I would love let's that. do it. Cool. Yay. Thanks guys. <laughs> <laughs> yes. That's Thanks for that. Thanks for, for that workshop. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, but another, I don't know. We only have a couple of minutes left. Yes. Justin, I know you're, you and I are going to talk about, you know, sort of the community piece, right? With some of the work that you're doing, um, which I'm very excited about. Yeah, me too. Looking forward to that conversation. Yeah. Um, yeah. 